Well, good evening. Welcome to School Days, Help for Moms and Dads of School-Aged Kids. I'm Danita Bailey. This and is, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I, I am still your husband. <laughs> You know, when we just celebrated six. We just celebrated sixteen years of marriage this past weekend, and she's acting like she's a single woman. I'm sorry. I'm so used to doing the show by myself. You want me to do it again? Yes. Okay. Welcome to School Days. Help for moms and dads of school and I'm, age and kids. I'm, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm David Bailey. <laughs> and I'm Danita Bailey. <laughs> This is the first week of school for many students and for the last month or so there have been there's been a heated national debate about when and how to reopen schools. Some, some schools have already opened in the US and what followed was social media posts of students crammed in crowded hallways with few masks and schools closing again because of students testing positive for COVID-19. Schools in at least four states recently have reported students who went back to school getting sick from coronavirus. I, for one, am definitely anxious about the start of the school year because of all the uncertainty. But here's what I know. Teachers are heroes. They really are rock stars. And they're passionate about the well-being and academic success of our students. So although things are quite crazy and teachers are being met with an almost impossible situation, I truly believe we will get through this. Our kids will be okay. So David, today was your first day of school. So how did that go? Yes, it was. Well, um, my school is having a very um, long, whoops, sorry, <laughs> paper blue here in the backyard. Uh, my, uh, my school is having a very long runway. So we have one, one, it was about an hour and a half of homeroom period. We did it as an entire uh, eighth grade group. Um, and we were going to do it initially individually, but we thought that we, we you know, the strength in numbers. And so we had a little introduction, uh, kids got back on, you know, and the typical online uh, challenges of, of um, you know, some kids didn't want to show their screens and some, some of the devices or internet uh, speed was slow. And so yeah, kids sounding all choppy and, you know, like, hey, hey, oh, hey, excuse me, yeah, you do it. You know, so we have that, of course, you know, and, and that just kind of goes, you know, anyone who remembers the springtime, it went like that as well. Um, but we had a chance to just answer a lot of questions and really, we just want just to assure them that um, everything is going to be okay. Um, we're only doing this whole first, we're only doing one hour of actual group time with our students, one hour, and then the rest of the day, we have a, a little assignment they have to do. And the assignment doesn't take that long to do. And, and then we, we're, basically we're onboarding them for the next three weeks. And then uh, by September 8th, um, tentatively, we're going to start genuine instruction. That's how our, our network's doing it. Mm -hmm. Some of our teachers are on campus in their classrooms meeting in Zoom just to get that familiarity. Um, I chose to stay home. They gave us that flexibility. Um, and, you know, we're still figuring stuff out. And, you know, we're going to figure stuff out as, as we go. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to get back to school and uh, looking forward to hearing uh, from our other expert teachers today. Yeah, I am too. So before we go any further, let me just say it does take a village. If you hear a great parenting tip or nugget of advice, share it with your parent friends. Facebook it, Instagram it, tweet it, or link it in and add the hashtag school day show and hashtag I am school days. And if you are listening to us on Facebook, you can drop us a question there. So let's jump right in and introduce our guests. So today we have a great group of educators that are passionate veteran teachers. Uh, with us today, we have Nasreen Adibi, we've got Alexi Della Fowder, and Thomas Bussey, and you know, not to mention David Bailey, who's also a teacher. So if you guys could just tell us what grade you teach, where you teach, how many years you've been teaching, and uh, when school starts for you, if it hasn't already started. What'd you say? Oh, my name is Alexi Delafetter. I teach freshmen at Bowie High School in Arlington. Uh, this will be my third year teaching um, in school. Professional development started um, about three days ago and my students come back virtually August 17th. All right. 
Hi, I am Kyrie Moore. I am third grade teacher in DeSoto ISD at the Meadows Elementary School. Um, this year I am third grade self-contained. This will be my fourth year in Texas and year 12, I think, in education. All right, school started for us, well, teachers for PD last Thursday and students are slated to come September 8th. And Carrie, for all the uh, people who don't know all the teacher jargon that we throw out there, what, what is PD? <laughs> Thank you for saying that, good point. <laughs> so PD is uh, an acronym for professional development. And so we are using this time to ensure that we equip teachers with the tools that they need in order to be successful for the school year. All right, all right. who's next? Um, I'm Nasreen Adibi, and I teach kindergarten. Um, I teach in Arlington, and I have been teaching, this is my fifth year, but first year virtually, so we're all in this <laughs> together, um, and schools will start digitally for us um, August 17th. All right, and my name is Thomas Bussey. I teach fifth grade in Atlanta, Georgia. And this is my 11th year teaching. And oh, school started for me last Monday. Uh, so our two weeks of PD or professional development. And then uh, our students start on next Monday. All right. You look like you just got right out of college. Uh, <laughs> I would have not have said 11 years. I hear you tricked me on that one. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. Yeah. Got that baby face. <laughs> 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 all right well let's go ahead and jump right in we've got a lot of ground to cover and people are really interested and i don't feel like i've heard a lot about what teachers are feeling um about this we've heard a lot from uh federal and state we've heard a lot from um, administrators but i feel like i haven't heard enough from the teachers who are the people who are really going to be putting all this into practice and you know on the, on the front lines and doing all this day to day. So I was excited to be able to talk to you guys and just kind of hear your point of view about uh, the, the uh, upcoming school year. So first I'd like to know, how did the spring go for you guys? We had to, we ended up in an emergency online teaching situation that took everybody by surprise. So tell me a little bit about how that went for you. Um, I think for kindergarten, at least, like it was, we were just doing what we could to keep in contact with the parents. And it took about two weeks to get an idea of what we're going to be doing and sending out Seesaw activities. And Seesaw is the um, program we go through for uh, pre K through second grade. So um, it took a second, but everyone, I think, just didn't know what was going on. And I think that helped because I didn't feel like I was misinformed in anything because no one was informed on anything. So, <laughs> right. um, parents had a lot of grace with us and um, we had a lot of grace with them because some of them went back to work. And I mean, we were only taking attendance once a week and uh, attendance for kindergarten literally sometimes was like just communication between the parents. I'm like, hey, is everything okay? Like, well, yeah, we're trying to get the work in, but I'm working full time and I'm not working from home and he's at his cousin's house and things like that. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of grace was given and it, it kind of helped out doing it in the spring. I think I have a better footing for the fall now. So yeah. Anybody else? For me, this spring was really about relationships with parents and with students because of course, there were many things that were outside of our control as a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, you know, parents being at work, we had a lot of parents who were essential workers. And so, you know, kids were not at home, kids were at grandparents' house, but it truly was a time of grace and a time of learning on both ends for the teachers and for the parents. Um, it, it was so, it was uncharted territory for everyone. And I think that Grace was the one thing that truly got us through it and it did better prepare us for what we are looking to do in the fall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, one of the hardest things was just not knowing that this was coming. So we had uh, a school not far from mine who had um, a coronavirus case 
uh, one week and then they closed down the district for like two days and then we came back for one day and we're thinking we're back in motion and then it was back to then we just never came back after that right. and so it was always like oh if we would have known that day that we were there to send home textbooks to yeah. let's go over how do you you know handle this online platform those types of things it would have been a lot easier um and so like she said it was it was mostly about just making sure those relationships were there my fifth graders were set to graduate at graduate fifth grade at the end of the year um mm. and they wanted that that ceremony they have most of my students have been there since pre-k and so to go through all of that and then at the end it's just like well nope you can't see your friends again um uh, so trying to make the most meaningful online graduation ceremony we could uh those are the things that really to me mattered the most yeah. Curie, I like that you said that it was about um, relationships with the parents as well. I felt like um, I already had a good relationship with um, some of my kids' teachers. You know, my we've got, um, a, we had a second grader, uh, she in second grade? No, she's in first grade. First grader, a, well, I can't think. What grades are our kids in, David? <laughs> <laughs> let, let, me, let me make it more simple. We have two elementary school kids and one, one was in middle school. And so you, with, with middle school, there's more teachers, obviously. So, but with the elementary mm -hmm. school kids, I felt like I already had a really good relationship with the teachers. And um, that I was just able to build on that because there was a whole lot of having to talk about things and figure stuff out. And so um, I, I felt like that just grew during this time out of necessity. Agreed. We were um, told to contact uh, parents by certain periods. So everyone, all parents were being called by someone at school to make sure that, you know, everyone was okay in the household, if they needed anything, if they knew about online resources, if they knew about where they could get lunches, things like that. Um, but it was nice to have already established relationships with parents because I still had some that were not in that group that I was calling, but that were still reaching out to me. Like they knew that, you know, they could call. Um, but I, I feel like if we had had this pandemic in the fall, I mean, like we're kind of doing now, it's a whole different ball game because we don't know these incoming kids and parents quite yet. Right, so it'll, right. it'll be really interesting to see how things evolve. Well, let's talk about that. How are, because you guys in the fall had the benefit of already knowing these kids, they knew you, some of the, the parents as well. So now that you're coming with a whole new crop of kids, some of you, David, I know you've got some of the same kids, um, but how are you going to build that relationship and, um, you know, in a virtual setting with parents and with students? Um, for me, I think that it's going to be a lot about flexibility. Um, I know that we have school hours where, you know, yes, I work 7.30 to 4, but my parents may not be available until 6 p.m., 7 p.m. Um, so I think in the beginning, we will need to show a lot of flexibility towards our parents and reaching out to our parents, making sure that parents know that we are available, being visible still, even if that's, you know, let's have a parent meeting on Zoom at 6 p.m. or calling our parents for things that are even not academic. So do you know that although, although your child is virtual, they can still come to the school to pick up breakfast and lunch? Um, oh. do you know about this nonprofit organization that has, you know, free tutoring for things like that. <laughs> you so you know, just making sure that parents see you, parents know that you are there and being flexible with parents because Again, this is new for us and it is new for them as well. Right. Um, let me ask about one of the things for me that I really wanted to make sure happened was the meet the teacher um, because that's where I feel like I built, I start building the groundwork of a relationship with the teacher by getting a little bit of face time, even though it's brief. Um, and I don't know if that was something that was planned in our district. And so I reached out to the school and said, hey, is this happening? And they said, oh yeah, we're gonna do um, a PowerPoint with a video in it. And I said, but no live Zoom or anything? Because <laughs> I feel like I wanna talk a little bit. So they, they ended up, it actually starts tonight, actually in about 30, 20 minutes is my first one that I won't be able to <laughs> to be on. Um, but um, we, uh, they, they ended up pivoting and um, are gonna do both. But um, Thomas, I know, actually that's how I found Thomas for the show is he had, well, I'll, you know, you can tell better than I did. Uh, what's the latest video that you have 
um, regarding this meet the teacher. Okay, so, and I'm sorry, I just got like my Wi-Fi just froze for a second and I came back in and you're saying my name. Yeah, I was nervous because um, I was like, I'm getting me? ready to talk about him and he's gone. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm back. Um, but yes, yeah, so uh, we had to create a, they said no longer, really no longer than a minute, a video introducing yourself to your students for this upcoming school year. And um, I, one of the things that I did this summer, knowing that I was going to be meeting these kids virtually up front, um, I asked my old students, like, who are some of the best YouTubers I should watch? Who should I be following on TikTok? Those types of things, just to kind of get ideas of what are, what's the online content that keeps you engaged? And how can I replicate that? Um, so I started watching all these uh, tutorials on how to edit videos and things like that. So uh, the video that I posted, uh, that I created, um, I wanted them to know that this year was gonna be magical, it was gonna be amazing. And so I figured out a way to edit the video so I could make myself disappear and kind of reappear throughout the video. Um, and so I posted it on Facebook the other day thinking like hey mom you know come check check out my video and then uh I get home and it's like 50,000 people have viewed it I was like oh wow that's more than my mom so uh <laughs> but it, it, my goal is that you know the kids will be excited when they see it and um I know like when you're on the internet the next tab over can be YouTube can be Fortnite um, so how do I keep you on the tab where I am talking about, you know, the, the, about math and, you know, the full lore? I've got to keep you engaged. So that, that was the kind of thought process behind it. Mm -hmm. I love that you took what the kids were interested in and yes. it towards them. I'm, I teach kindergarten. So like, I think a lot of my reassuring is for the parents, <laughs> the kids are like, bye mom. But the kid, the parents are the ones that are like, I'm not ready to let go. So we're doing a virtual sneak a peek. Um, and so they can, the parents can get to know me. Cause I mean, I'm taking, I'm the first introduction to school. So it's, right, it's a big right. deal that they're not able to like shake my hand or I'm not being able to like hug their child. You know, that's a big deal. So um, I'm glad that we're doing that. I just made like a quick PowerPoint and we're going to go over it through a zoom and they can ask me questions and get to know me a little bit better. But I love that video. I'm gonna have to look at that. How many how many viewers on it so far, Thomas? Oh man, the last time I saw it was it was over a hundred thousand. So <laughs> that's wild. Yeah. That's so fun. Anybody else in the the meet the teacher? Um, well, I don't know what we're doing just yet as a campus, but I did create a Bitmoji classroom so that you know it has my little Bitmoji uh, picture and it's in Google Slides. And so you can click on, it says, you know, like click here to meet Mrs. Moore and it's my all about me page. And then I have a slide with all of our important links that they'll need like class link and STEM scopes and Schoology, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, my goal for my Bitmoji classroom, um, I'm an anchor chart queen. I love anchor charts. Me and it's too. Well, uh, because my anchor charts would normally be up the entire school year for students, the goal of my Bitmoji classroom is to have my anchor charts there. And I found a way to basically record my voice reading the anchor charts and put like a little sound under each anchor chart so that they can click on it and read it. And they'll have the anchor chart for the duration of the school year as if we were still inside of the classroom. Okay, so Miss Moore, um, so what what is an anchor chart, Miss Moore? <laughs> so an anchor chart <laughs> is an instructional tool. Uh, basically, what we do with anchor charts is it is a visual model. It's a representation for students. We use it all subjects, uh, from math, for instance, for fractions. On my anchor chart, I may have fractions at the top, and then I have what a fraction is. So I have it in words, and then I may have a picture of a fraction. So if it's three fourths, I'll show them different ways that they can represent three fourths, three fourths on a number line, um, three fourths as parts of a whole, things like that. So anchor charts are really great instructional tools for students. Typically, they are up for the entire school year so that students can constantly refer to them. And shockingly, even when they come down, students have memorized where the anchor chart is. 
And just the simple act of turning and looking at this blank wall, they remember what was there on that anchor chart. All right, thank you. <laughs> She's like, she asked me one more time to explain one more thing, David. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna get you. <laughs> no, it's good to know. No, well, you guys, you guys for sure, you teachers have all these acronyms and different <laughs> phrases. And I know a couple of them having been married to a teacher for a while, but sometimes I just kind of drift off because I'm like, I have no idea what's she, happening she, here. Yeah, she, she tunes me out half the time. So, I mean, I'm just used to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, somebody, Thomas, somebody wanted to know the name of the video so they can go look it up. Comment from oh, online. The name of the video, it just it says um or how can mama? they find it? How can they find it? Look mama. Look mama. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is on it's public on my Facebook page. So I mean it's Thomas. Don't you Jay's have a page. website or a something? There's something at educator something. Oh, at the best educator on Instagram. So I did oh. also post it on Instagram. Okay, so at the best educator, yes? Yes. Okay. It, it's go. because I want to become the best educator, not because I think I am. Oh, you think you all that, huh? Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, that, that, that honestly didn't even go through my head when I saw that. So <laughs> you're good. You're good. You're good. All right, Dave. Uh, yeah. So um, do you think, do you feel, well, okay. Do you feel like the voice of teachers have been heard um, collectively? I'm, I know on, on Facebook, you know, we, we, we have our own pages and we are definitely speaking to ourselves. Right. <laughs> you know, we have a lot to say to ourselves. But do you think at large, do you, do you feel like um, our voice is being heard? We had a survey sent out to all the employees um, on what their thoughts were, if they felt comfortable, what their range was. And I think it was on a number scale. So yeah, I think definitely our, our voices have been heard at least in my district. And I feel I feel for those teachers who weren't given a choice. Um, and I feel for those families who weren't given a choice either. Uh, I think in all of this with the flexibility and the grace, I think a choice has to be given as well because we're offering a service. So whatever your thoughts are, whatever your, you know, best way to educate your family in this time or for your child, I think is the way to do it. Um, but I'm glad they sent that survey because I felt like at least I could voice what I was feeling. And then even if he said you were uncomfortable, they actually followed up and gave you a call back and um, oh, wow. spoke with you. So I thought that was pretty awesome. Um, in my district, we had a survey as well that was sent to all of the employees. You know, your it you know it was a preference survey, so it it doesn't necessarily mean that you know if you put this, this is what you're going to get. But I did enjoy the fact that someone did ask, you know, what was my preference and even into, you know, if you chose virtual, why? You know, right. because there are people who have their own underlying health conditions. There are people who have family members with underlying health conditions. There are parents like me, uh, all three of my kids will be at home. And so I'm, you know, happy that someone decided to ask teachers. What was their opinion? What was their thought? And what was their preference? I think our district has done a, a pretty good job um, when it comes to like nationally, when it comes to like a bigger voice, I, it's hard to say. Um, I don't think as much coverage has, I mean, I don't think I see as much coverage about it as I would like from a teacher perspective uh, on the news and, you know, nationally. Um, but I, I think I, it's just wild how much it varies from district to district or state to state or city to city. There's not a unified, you know, voice response, anything like that. So it's kind of a weird situation that very much varies depending on where you are. Okay. All right. Um, I, I know, I know for me that we, um, we had like a, a town hall for the teachers in our, in our network. Um, and we had a chance to, share our concerns to share um you know what's the best route going forward um and then and just how we're going to collectively you know approach this um and I, I thought that you know they they really took our our voice to heart and so you know i'm seeing that reflected today you know like i said some some teachers were on campus today um and uh some teachers were at home and you know it, you know we did all of our professional development virtually um, 
uh, and you know, so it it I, like I said, I think from district to district, it is, you know, depending upon where you are, is going to dictate kind of how it goes. Um, yeah, again, nationally, uh, I think you know there are stories out there. Um, I I I, I don't think you know, our versus the voice haven't heard as much, um, but we do have a voice, um, and um, you know, just like with everybody else, we have families and we have. Uh, you know, uh, responsibilities and things we have to take care of as well. And so, um, you know, whenever possible, it always it is good to hear, you know, where we're coming from, because um, we're going to be the ones teaching, teaching your children as well. So, um, so, well, let me ask a question. You just said um, something, and maybe you're about to ask that question. You can ask that question. <laughs> I think you might be. Go ahead. Sorry. I what was I? Okay. I don't know. Okay. Well, it's hard okay, to so, not be in the same room. All right. <laughs> <laughs> How are Kelly and and, uh, and uh, Ryan doing it? Um, Live with Kelly and Ryan. Yes, but I, I think that's okay. only you. I don't. I don't watch that, babe. So yeah, I know. I, okay. I, I, yeah. Thanks. I, I don't know. You, 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 you tell that. us, babe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. So, so uh, we we, we want to hear the voices of the teachers. Do you think personally that there should be? Um, a rush to return back to schools um, in person. You know, there's there's kind of a debate on both sides of the spectrum, and uh, and then why why or why not? Uh, well, I would say no. <laughs> there shouldn't be a rush, um, and mainly because at the end of the day, it's about um, just health and safety. Um, and you know, we all go through the teacher program and taking all the 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 classes learning about um, the, the hierarchy of needs and all of those things. And we know that at the base of all of that is that feeling of safety. And so I think about myself being in, in my face-to-face -face classroom, had I been one of the teachers that was forced to be face-to-face -face with a room of 25 students that can't be socially distanced, they're not going to get the full Mr. Bussy experience. I'm honestly not, I'm not getting in your personal space. I'm not, high-fiving you at the door. I'm not doing any of those things. And so that experience that you were hoping to get in that face-to-face -face instruction, I'm not even, you raise your hand, I'm not coming to your desk to answer your questions <laughs> or point at <laughs> number three on your desk. I'm not. <laughs> so I am more likely to give you that one-on-one -on -one assistance in a virtual, you know, you can connect with me one-on-one -on -one and I can help you all, you know, through the computer. Um, but until that that feeling of safety can be there, I think it would be really hard to get the quality of education either way um, that you would typically get in a normal classroom under normal under normal circumstances. And we should also say, Thomas, um, you are one of those teachers that wears costumes. I saw you riding a bike down the hallway. <laughs> like you're you do the whole nine. So those are some things that you I mean, you can't ride your bike on Zoom, but those, you know, some of the costume wearing and things like that is stuff that you can really still do really well um, on Zoom. But when you've got all these barriers of needing to, you know, protect yourself and everybody else, it's more difficult right. to be creative like that. So yeah, right. I, I see exactly. what you're saying. And at the end of the day, you know, I I have older parents and in-laws that that's who's in the back of my mind. And I don't want to be sitting in the classroom all day thinking I can't help you with number three because, you know, my mom might get sick. So this kind of gives that sense of comfort and that sense of safety. And I think that's important. I agree 100%. Um, I think at the very top of, you know, the priority list are student health, teacher health. Um, we always talk about how we cannot teach kids if they are not socially and emotionally um, you know, cared for. And so it kind of goes back to teachers too. If we're, our, you know, needs and health are also not being cared for, how are we going to pour into kids too? Right. If we're worried about our family, our kids, our students, I, I mean, life or death matters. It, it could be, we never know. Um, so I definitely agree with uh, Mr. Bosey. Like, it's just, it's, it's a scary, you know, thing to be considering. And you don't think when you're, you know, uh, going down the teacher career path, like this is, this is what's next, so. Right. Yeah, it's totally a whirlwind. And I, I mean, I agree with both of you wholeheartedly um, because when we, when we think about school, I, I understand, you know, I hate to say that I do understand the rush to go back, but as an educator, I know that it is easier to 
an academic gap than it is to fill an emotional gap for someone who has lost their child. Yeah. Um, and so wow. uh, we are looking at it as, oh my God, they're, they're going to be so far behind and they're going to lose so much schooling. And, you know, yes, we hear all of that, but what they fail to realize is speaking for me personally, I have been in school for now seven years and I owe the government more money than I'll ever make in a life <laughs> for someone to teach me how to effectively teach. And so I feel that at, as an educator, we have all the research, we have the tools that we need to fill the academic gaps for children. At this point, we need to ensure that socially and emotionally and health-wise that we are all okay. Because yes, we are focused on the students, but what about the teachers? It's, you know, it's as if no one is thinking about, hey, these teachers have children at home. These right. teachers, while you may be an adult, you may be caring for an elderly parent. It's as if, you know, no one is thinking about the mental, the social, and the emotional states of educators as they think about, you know, what's best for students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So since district plans have been so fluid, what are you guys doing? How have you been preparing for the school year? A lot of Zoom calls. <laughs> A lot of Zoom calls with our teens. Um, yeah, I've been, I think with me, I try to not get too anxious because things are just changing by the hour. Um, so I'm just doing what I can. I went into the classroom, even though we're not going to be back um, on our first day of school, just to put things back the way they are, because for my needs, I just need to have some normalcy and you know, it's not going to look the same, but I, I don't know what it's going to look like and no one can tell me that right now. So instead of worrying about what's going to happen, I'm just trying to prepare for what I do know. And I know that I'm going to have kids and I know that I know that I'm going to teach inside the classroom virtually. So I'm just trying to prepare and take it one bite at a time. Um, we are collaborating as a team on Zoom a lot and we're trying to be consistent we have uh, six other teachers, so there's seven of us. And, you know, having siblings in our classrooms and twins and things like that, we're just trying to keep it all consistent so it's easier for the kid to navigate and for the parents to navigate um, everything. So consistency, really. We've talked about the same thing, um, I, not even just for siblings, but for the sake of the kids and the sake of the teachers. Um, but it's weird because we're trying to make our Canvas courses all beautiful and whatnot. And like, we have to learn how to do that. And then we have to teach the kids how to do that. And so it's just, you know, how to interact on there. It's um, a bunch of things that, a bunch of pieces have to be put together. And it only gets a little harder when like the dates change or this change or these circumstances or this um, standard or whatever. Um, so it's like she was saying, you can't really, we are of course stressed and anxious, but if you let yourself, you know, get into that hole, like, oh my goodness, you'll stay there forever because mm -hmm. <laughs> there's, there's just so much changing. Um, and I think what's helping me stay calm, like kind of Nastrina said, is the grace of our district. They really have been being very like, hey, we know y'all don't know exactly what you're doing. We are also trying to figure it out. Well, maybe they didn't say it in those words, but I think that's what they mean. <laughs> it's been like really reassuring that um, they haven't been like, this needs to happen and this needs to happen and th by this day, and you need to be an expert in this, this, and this. And that, that hasn't been the tone, at least in our district. So I know it's not the case across you know the states, but it's been good for us so far. Well, speaking of that, we have a question from uh, one of our Facebook view viewers, Lee Darden. I know Curie might know that person. Um, he would like to know what's the best way administration can support, can provide support for you guys at this time? Um, I, I think the, the best way, and it's not just administrative, this is kind of my motto for the year is to be and to exhibit patience. Um, it is this, like, I, I know I've said it before, this is uncharted territory. You know, Harry Wong did not publish the first day of virtual school. Um, right. <laughs> and so I, I think patience, 
will definitely be key because this is the one time, well, not the one time when we first got out of college as well, we are learning and teaching at the exact same time. And it is not all about content anymore. Um, it is definitely about the social and emotional health of students and the social and emotional health of teachers. So definitely be patient with me, Mr. Darden, be patient. <laughs> That's her <Yeah>. principle. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? I think like, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Thomas. Go for it. I'm tired of hearing my voice. Go, go, go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I know for me, it, it's similar, just showing that patience, um, but also just being vulnerable because we do all, this is new for everybody. And so not pretending to be the expert, but really just getting in there with us and, and joining us in this journey, trying to figure it out. Um, you know, my district had these big plans for everybody to get on. Um, we use Microsoft Teams for trainings today. And then they had to make the announcement that it was too many people on at the same time and things weren't working. And so knowing that when that happens next week, when the kids get on, like that's not my fault that the technology isn't working. Like we, we still need to be, you know, in this together and just trying to figure it out and do what's best for the kids. Mm. Okay. Um, I, I know for, for me, um, just be honest, be forthright. Um, uh, sometimes if this, if ministers and I are careful, um, sometimes I'm just looking at just at, at the nation at large and, and they're acting like they have all the answers and they don't. Just tell us, you know, just tell us. We don't Amen. know. That's true. Just don't, we don't know. And tell me, don't say, you know, it's going to be two weeks from now you don't know you don't know how the case is going to go right you, you, you don't know so you know um or what's the best way to go about doing something um as well um and, and i think and also i think encouraging uh encouraging educators to get out of the box mm -hmm. of how they've taught in the past um not just trying to recreate the classroom on a video Mm -hmm. um and, and my wife already knows this and i'm not going to get on my little soapbox about this here but but just um allow as uh you know as uh, my my cohorts here have said to just allow a lot of teachers to try new things um mm -hmm. and explore um there's a lot of um great things that can come out of this and not just you no know, don't just reel it in now, this is a time to experiment um you know we're not going to compromise content but Maybe the way it's delivered can be done differently um, as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, some people know that in the fall, teachers usually spend, is it six weeks reteaching or four weeks reteaching? Lots of weeks reteaching um, because of summer learning loss. So, now on top of summer learning loss, we have kids that have even bigger gaps as a result of schools closing and there being spotty participation of students. So what do you guys think that you're going to do to try to fill some of those gaps? And you know, if, if your administration has um, spoken to that as well, I'd love to know what they had to say. Uh, for me, uh, and I know Texas teachers probably know about this, but we have Teach Resource System. And Teach Resource System is a phenomenal tool for educators, but they have created a, I wanna make sure I say it correctly, COVID-19 gap implementation tool. And so Teach Resource System, we also call it ERS, another acronym. Um, what they have done for us is they have said, okay, Miss Moore, you taught third grade math last year. So your students are going to come into third grade and they have missed some concepts due to COVID-19. So here's a plan to show you where you can spiral in those skills that were missed. And so it gives you a great guide that says they miss, you know, 2.3a, which is a teak or a standard. The best time to reteach that teak is during this window when you teach. Oh. Um, so we have such a wonderful tool right there. Um, in addition to as educators, we always give a pre-assessment because we need to know 
what do students know when they walk through my door? Mm -hmm. and, and we use the data from that pre-assessment to drive our instruction. So we then say, okay, this is unit one, this is what I am teaching, but this is where my students are. And so because this is where my students are, this is where I need to start. And I need to bridge that gap between where they are and where they need to be. Um, Thomas, so you're not in Texas, you're in Atlanta. Right. Um, or Georgia. Yeah. And um, so do you guys have anything similar? You guys don't have teaks. Do. do you do Common Core in Georgia? Um, Technically, no, we do Georgia standards of excellence, but if you look at them next to the mm -hmm. common core standards, there's like two verbs that are different. So, mm -hmm. um, so yes, in a way, um, but we have a similar, um, similar setup. Our district has provided, provided us with our scope and sequence of what we're going to be teaching this year. And then for each unit, um, so unit one, here's the prerequisite skill that your students may have missed. Um, but you don't know, maybe they didn't miss it. Maybe they did get it during that, um, during their online school in, in the spring. So everything is about the pre-assessment, like she said. Um, so we have been directed to give, even if it's just an informal, quick couple of questions on the fourth grade standard, then that will kind of inform where we go from there. And if I need to pull a group of five students that didn't get it, or if I need to reteach it to the entire class, that'll kind of give me an idea of what to do but we've got a schedule to make sure that we're filling in anything that they may have missed. We had a show a couple of months ago and we had a teacher on the show and she said um, that teachers are trained to fill in the gaps. Would you, would you agree with that? And then kind of speak to that because this is one of the, the big points of anxiety that parents are feeling is, oh my gosh, my kid's gonna be behind. They're not gonna go to college. They're gonna be a bum. <laughs> because of coronavirus. <laughs> so if you could speak to that somebody just a little bit. We are trying to fill in the gap, something kind of interesting. So with our online format, I know every district's different, but um, we, in our school day, will have embedded time for small groups. So we can have certain groups, um, just us and, you know, a few kids or however many, you know, we want to um, be with. And so what Ms. Moore was saying was how, you know, we'd give a pre-assessment and see where kids are, where the baseline is, where are we starting? And then based on that, you know, I can pull um, a small group of children and work on a, a few of these, you know, specific skills that they're not doing so hot on. And so we, we make it happen. Um, it's not always easy or wonderful, but one tiny silver lining of online classes, normally I'm doing that and there's 20 other kids just, you know, doing their thing while I have a small group in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Now I get to kick them all off Zoom, except for my little group. And I mean, there's no distractions. So like I said, there's not an amazing, um, you know, not a whole lot of wonderful things when it comes to doing virtual minus, you know, our health, which is number one, but I do, I'm going to appreciate that time. In the spring, um, I had office hours, an hour a day. I always put my lessons online. And then I said, if you need me like this virtually, because we didn't have a requirement to be, um, I'll be on this hour every day. And I had a small group of, of two boys and their friends. So I think they were just bored to be honest, but <laughs> we went over commas and on just the three of us and what they could do from just that, you know, two on one interaction blew me away. So I have hundred percent faith in our ability to um, fill gaps where we need to fill gaps. Excellent. Um, one of the criticisms of online learning is that it's boring and it doesn't engage the kids. Um, so what will you be doing to make sure that um, online learning is engaging for your students this fall? Oh, well, I'll go on that one. Um, like I said earlier, one of the big things that I did with my last group and what I plan to do um, with this group is find out what are the things that actually engage you online and try to emulate that so that um, I am improving that engagement. Uh, I spent a lot of time this summer uh, not just watching like professional development teacher videos, but even um, how to start a YouTube channel, even though I had no intention mm -hmm. of doing that. But I know I spend a lot of time watching YouTube videos. And so if I can make it so that my videos or my live lessons, like what makes you want to watch Ninja live stream while all he's doing is sitting in a chair and playing video games? Like, yes. what is he doing that I can 
like that I can copy that and make you want to watch me talking about like I said earlier the cold war or whatever um so what it is, is it <laughs> my kids watch that man all day too <laughs> uh well, tell me when I, you I figure think, it out I, I think it's the it's the passion and the energy that he brings um <laughs> and you know I was watching something from Ron Clark earlier and one of the things that he was saying was even make sure that you're standing up while you're teaching just like you would be in the classroom. When you sit down, your energy goes down. So sit your laptop on something high, get up and be at your board. The same, bring that same energy that you would um, to your traditional classroom, to your virtual classroom. And you can find ways to keep the kids engaged. Totally. I think energy is going to be huge. I also think um, we have to be very selective with what um, resources we're providing and like what text my kids are going to read. That's going to be everything. Um, I remember in the spring, we did an article about arranged marriages. We got to watch a little intro video about how kids around the world kind of felt about it. And they actually got into it. They're, like some of it, it blew their minds and, you know, just finding things that are relevant, culturally relevant, what's going on in the world. Um, because if it's not engaging, if they have no interest in it, it's not going to happen. And I, I'm not going to be there to, you know, baby them into it so they've got to they have to kind of learn to be independent learners in a way but i have to provide the excitement i have to provide the the cool resources and um basically work on the engagement factor mm -hmm. um for me i think that um one it will definitely be about bringing the energy to your online classroom um definitely will have to make things relevant for students um, culturally relevant, what is going on in the world around them today, um, and also tapping into student choice and passion-based learning. So giving students an opportunity, if we're doing multiplication, for them to show me the way that they want to show me how they learned this skill or how could they apply it to their own life. So I think Making it relevant, culturally relevant, student choice and passion-based learning are going to be key to keeping students engaged. You know, somebody said something to me the other day about engaging the kids by in including their families in what they're doing. And since we're at home, there kind of is an opportunity that normally wouldn't be there for the parent to jump in and say, you know, you're learning about whatever, we're from that country or whatever, mm -hmm. and these are our customs and things like that. Um, and that I think does a lot for a student to feel like, you know, my background, my people are important enough for it to be a part of what we're learning um, in, this, in this lesson. Yeah, I did um, our fifth grade uh, in, in Georgia learns about September 11th. Um, as a part of our U.S. history. And so last year, that was one of the things that our students had to interview their parents or someone who was alive during that time, which is crazy to me that that's like history now. <laughs> right. um, but for, for none, none of my students were alive when it happened. And so in their mind, there's no difference between that and, you know, World War II. It's all like, it all goes together. <laughs> and so, but them being able, I mean, some of the parents even got in on the, they had to do a flip grid telling what their parents did and the parent was sitting right there with them and being uh, you know just as engaged in it um and i also think i'm sorry mr Bussey, what is a flip uh -huh. grid oh ah i tried to not have you have to ask me that <laughs> so flip grid is a, a website that allows students to uh allows a teacher to record a video to ask questions or things like that create topics for the students to talk about and then the students can record little short videos in response and they can reply to one another uh, um, so it's just in a website or an app that you can use to facilitate class discussion. Hey, Mr. Bailey, uh, yeah, ask me one more time. Oh, leave man, me alone, leave me alone, man. Leave you me got alone, man. me. You got me. <laughs> um, Usually, I'm the one that's uh, that's bring bring this up up because I'm the one that the odd man out of educators. <laughs> but I, I do think that the relationship you have with kids is what's going to be the most important. Um, mm -hmm. Scheduling a lunch time to eat lunch with each of them just to get to know them because I'm not meeting you face to face. Um, you know, people that we have strong rapport with, I'll call my best friend on FaceTime with absolutely nothing to talk about, but we'll be on the phone for 30 minutes just because of the relationship that we have. So if I can build that type of rapport with my students, then they're more likely to get online and wanna hear what I have to say, even if it is a boring lesson that day. 
yeah. Um, I, I know for me, I, I think as everyone was saying, the key is one is, are the relationships um, that uh, I also was talking with our team just yesterday saying how critical these first couple of weeks, if we don't get through all the content, but we have established a good relationship with the kids, um, that's going to be probably the most important factor is, is, is do they have buy-in um, from you? Do they believe you? Do they believe that you can take them where they need to go um, and will you keep them engaged? And another part is, in, is, is engagement um, and uh, getting them excited about, and I want my kids to be excited about coming online, you know, the, the coming into my class. Um, I'm going to be using a lot of uh, play, uh, like using games and making it competitive um, as well. Um, also, um, I'm going to be focusing less on quantity of work, but qual like depth of work and also relevance. So um, last year, right when this hit, um, we, we're going right into, I was just starting to teach on and it's my, my math nerd side of me, but about, about quadratic functions and about the the, 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 the curve, you know, you're talking about flattening the curve. And so we were, we, I dove right into it and I was talking about, you know, what are the factors that could lead to an increase in cases? And they started talking about those things. And, you know, I was an economics major. So I started bringing in, well, what about, you know, but before they say gas prices were high, but you notice that gas prices have dropped that supply and demand and, and talking about slope. And we were making you know, connections between those two. And I got the, you know, I got to pull, pull out sides of me that I hadn't been able to before. Um, and so my goal is I want to do a, a lot of project-based learning. Um, so it's not as much about getting answers right for the test per se, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll work on that, but I want to get them to see that math is not just for the SATs and not math is not just to get ready uh, for the state test in May, which is sometimes we feel like the pressure was there, but I, I felt like I was kind of released and so coming into the fall now, I'm going to be using that same, um, I, I feel free now to make this what I want it to be. Mm -hmm. So when they leave, they're really excited about mathematics and they can see it in real world time and real world application as well. So that, that's my goal um, as we build those relationships along the line as well. So. Let's talk about safety a little bit, because that's obviously the big elephant in the room. What, if anything, has been shared with you guys from your administration about the safety measures that are going to be put in place, and what are your responsibilities? I think for us right now, it's like one bite at a time. So it's like we're focusing on virtual. I did go into my classroom. I had a big jug of hand sanitizer and uh, two sprays. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with that yet, but I think we're just <laughs> <laughs> focusing on yeah. what we kind of know is happening at the moment. I have, I don't know. <laughs> okay. I have no clue. <laughs> okay. No clue. I feel very safe from behind the computer. Yes. And is, is, does anybody have any like clear partitions in front of their desk? No. no. Okay. Our secretary. So we did. Oh. oh, the front staff does. Okay. Yeah, same for our building. We did receive cleaning supplies um, and they've got some systems in place, uh, um, the fiber cloths that we can use in um, the different sprays. And then they have like bins for us to dump the fiber cloths in, into uh, every day and you get a new clean one. Um, but you are expected to wipe down your classroom at the end of every day to make sure that the surfaces are clean. Um, we did all receive hand sanitizer and masks and things like that um, and so our district has come up with a return plan based on the number of cases in our areas and so uh, it will start off September 8th our kids um, kindergarten through second grade actually come back for 90 minutes one day a week uh, in small groups and then mm -hmm. third grade through 12th grade will uh, be able to schedule one-on-one -on -one appointments where students can come in and have a face-to-face -face appointment with their teacher starting September 8th. And then from there, they've got like five tiers before we get to full face-to-face -face and everybody's in the building where they add, you know, a half day of instruction a week and then two days of instruction a week. Um, so it, it did feel good to know that there is at least a plan and the plan is based on data and facts and numbers. It's not just, you know, we're, all right, we're tired of this, you know, everybody come back. So it will have to, the numbers will have to sustain for at least two weeks um, 
at each level before they enact the next phase of the plan. Well, I'm, I'm glad you said that because in Georgia, isn't that, aren't there some school districts that are already back? They've been back for actually a couple of weeks and they're yes. experiencing some issues. Yes. So yes. Those, those schools that have been on the news with the pictures of all the kids crowded in the hallways. So I know Paulding County, Cherokee County were two of the, the biggest districts that were just not doing online school. Um, I know Cherokee County was getting a lot of pushback. So they did offer online, but then said that they would not offer um, school computers so if you wanted to do online you had to provide your own technology um, and so there's been a lot of controversy of course about that um, but they started on Monday so I haven't actually heard anything about them yet from the news um, but I know Paulding County of course the student that posted that picture uh, that went viral has been all over the place right and she or he I don't know was suspended for doing that but now there's kids that have come down with coronavirus in that school, so. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, they, they, I, I, I don't know that. They yeah. did um, take away the suspension because of, okay. because of the public backlash. So they did mm -hmm. uh, allow the students to come back. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, um, I, I know in our school, you know, they're, they're giving us actually medical scrubs to wear um, oh, wow. every day. Yeah, and, and a face mask and um, a shield as well. Uh, oh. So I'm gonna be I'm gonna be pretty pretty guarded up there. Um, now, knowing my wife, I'm not to strip naked every day when I come home. You're right um, about that. Yeah. <laughs> At the door in the garage. Uh, pretty much, I'll be, I'll, I'll be in my socks and like I'm in the door. Uh, but but you know um, uh, they're gonna have uh, hand handless uh, touchless hand sanitizer stations in each room, so you don't have to touch anything. Um, they have reconfigured the entire school. Uh, to max to max social distancing guidelines. So like, uh, I'm moving classrooms this year, which I'm a little salty about. But um, I can only have 11 students maximum in my class. Um, and they actually even adjusted my my rosters um, to fit that, except for my geometry kids. I don't know how they're gonna do that. But uh, like half the kids uh, said they want to come back. So half the kids are coming back. So half are not as of right now. Mm -hmm. um and so you know they have been really really strategic about it now the only sad thing is um i have a more of a i have like a family room a living room thing going on in my classroom and all that furniture that i have i have flat screen tvs and subwoofers and gaming chairs and stuff um wow. i'm not to figure out what to do with all that stuff they told me i, I can't bring it in the classroom because it won't there just won't be enough space and socially distanced so i'm gonna be a little sad about that but um but i can tell that they really put a lot of thought into it they've been very very busy this summer reconfiguring everything and i can tell that you know, our top leadership has really been very thoughtful as far as making sure to the best of their ability to make sure that that we're safe you know and, and i'm gonna i'm gonna be you know we have two immunocompromised people in my family so i, I have to come home healthy every day um right. and so um but i'm glad that and it's not just me thinking about it for my district it's they're thinking about that as well so mm -hmm. How are your schools preparing you to handle the social and emotional impact of all of the last four, maybe five months on the students regarding the pandemic, the loss of loved ones or prolonged sickness, racial unrest, all of the madness that's happened in the last couple of months? Um, how have they equipped you to, or how are they equipping you to? And if you don't feel like they are, what would you like them to do? Don't answer it once. Social emotional learning has been um, very stressed. We actually covered um, a unit on it today in our professional development. Um, so there are a lot more resources, and it's it's more than ever being stressed. Like teachers need to know where to find these at any given point in time. So whether it's a virtual referral form or whatever, and what we can be implementing in the classroom to acknowledge social emotional needs virtually because that does look different than in the classroom. Um, and we're gonna have to use different strategies and techniques. So, um, so far providing resources um, so that we're, it's not on us to come up with all the best practices, like they're doing the groundwork for us, which I do appreciate. Um, but yeah, I think it's gonna be a little bit of a learning curve regardless. Our um, in our provide you go. <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, our district did provide a social emotional learning program that's going to be mandatory for pre-K through 12th grade. Um, and so we can, it's a 45, 45 minutes a week 
So we'll most likely break it down to 15 minutes three times uh, a week. And just they gave us the lesson plan. So it's scripted enough to where if you want to just go by the book, you can. Um, but they've also given us the flexibility to be creative with those lessons. But they did provide that um, as, a, as something that was mandatory for this upcoming school year. For us in my district, um, I'm not sure of what curriculum we will use for social emotional learning, but we do have time built into our schedules each day for social emotional learning. Um, I believe that the sample schedule has it twice a day, the beginning of the day and at the end of the day for mm -hmm. us to have social emotional lessons with our students. Right. Our mandatory P rest of our professional development is actually on Wednesday. So I feel like I'll have way more answers yeah. in a couple of days. <laughs> well, I wanna know, you know, just beyond what the schools are doing, how are you preparing yourself? How are you centering yourself and preparing, knowing that some of these kids have experienced trauma, um, some of these people have experienced loss, We've seen images in the media of rioting and all sorts of things. So knowing your babies have been experiencing these things over the last four months, how are, is there anything that you're doing to get in the right mind space to, um, to shepherd these kids? Um, I don't, this is going to sound very strange. I don't think that we could like actually like prepare ourselves. So, you know, for lack of better words on what, our, what traumas our children will bring. I think that it's more so knowing up front that yes, our children will come back to us with a lot of trauma. Um, being flexible with those students that have trauma, allowing students to express themselves even at a younger age. So for example, I know that we have built into our schedule writing, writing across the curriculum, meaning that you write in every subject. And mm -hmm. so during that writing time, allowing students to have a free write to write about what you are feeling. Um, having some type of system in place for students to come to you to express their needs. So normally in the classroom, you know, we would tell students, I have an open door policy. If there's anything that you would like to talk about, you know, just come tell us more about it. And I think virtually we will have to create some, some type of policy that, you know, so that students know, hey, although I'm not face to face with you, I am still here. So I think it's more so just knowing that our kids are going to have trauma, but I don't know if there's a, a system that we can put in place for, you know, if they come to you with this, this is what you do, because it'll be just our luck. We are going to create a system for every trauma except the one that. <laughs> yes, and like yeah, there's no system because we've never done this before. This is yeah. <laughs> unprecedented, as everybody's uh, saying. Um, cause you know, not even just the kids have experienced trauma, teachers have experienced trauma and are overwhelmed. So go ahead. That's right. Yeah. I was just thinking it like on top of the, you know, the illnesses and the death things that also you might be like, that's not important right now are very important to kindergartners, missed birthdays, vacations, lost, mm -hmm. you know, all those mm -hmm. things that they're not going to be there on the first day of school. Like trying to understand that because those are the things that are so important to them right now. And, you know, like, oh, okay, well, if you did have a birthday party, who would you invite? You know, all those kinds of things, like letting them be upset about that because sometimes as adults, we're like, there are bigger things <laughs> to worry about than your drive-by birthday party, you know, like, so I think just being open for them and letting them have that space to, you know, talk and vent about their kindergarten problems. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I have been, oh. No, go ahead. Uh, I've been just trying to find people on social media, on mm -hmm. Instagram, on Twitter, who have, are anti-racist teachers, um, people who have more experience talking about these issues um, just so that I can get an idea of what 
what that conversation actually looks like in a fifth grade classroom uh, where I'm not overstepping my boundaries. Um, but I know that <clears throat> those conversations might, th when certain topics come up of some of this civil unrest, uh, what does that conversation look like? Um, so that I can facilitate it in a way that's still professional, um, but allowing the kids to express what they're feeling and you know what their thoughts are. Yeah. Alexi, did you have something to add? Oh, well, I mean, he made me think about a lot of things, but yeah, um, this summer has been kind of spent, honestly, preparing for those harder conversations, heavy conversations, um, making sure, you know, we have equity within our classrooms. Um, so there is a lot that's going to go into this school year outside of the pandemic period, um, just because this has been, a, you know, a wild 2020 um, and just making sure all students feel um, not only acknowledged, but you know, appreciated and um, there are given affirmations and whatnot. It's going to be, it's going to be taxing, but uh, that's, I think that's, it's whoa. That is part of the job we did sign up for. We did sign up for, um, you know, being there for students' needs. It's not with an asterisk, oh, unless, you know, this, this, or this happens, then mm -hmm. we don't worry about that. Like, we know what we're getting ourselves into when we sign up to be educators yeah. to, to a certain extent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I know for me, um, in the springtime, what I noticed a lot was, you know, I'd have blocks of time where I would meet with my algebra kids, my geometry kids. And what I noticed was we would get through the time and say, okay, guys, time to go. And without fail, my wife was always asked, why are you all, why are you still online? And they asked me all the time, Mr. Bailey, can we just stay on and just hang out mm -hmm. and talk? Mm -hmm. We've been on for another hour, hour and a half, just, just talking, just, you know, kids do, you know, doing hair. I mean, they, they were just comfortable. They just got, they just, I mean, I was I feel like I was at home with them. I mean, right. <laughs> and they were, you know, I feel like I was in their family rooms with them and they just wanted to talk. And they'd ask questions about life or about the coronavirus. And we just, we just, you know, chop it up a little bit. And I think that really helped them to bring some stability. And you know, we know a whole lot more now, but when everything was still new and we we're trying to figure out what in the world was going on, they just wanted to, to, to talk with each other and to talk to me. Um, and I think some of the best bonds I made with some of my kids was during that time. Um, and I'm, I'm glad I did. And I want to you know, open up some other opportunities, maybe after hours to do maybe like a, like a study hall time and they can get together and talk and hang out. And, you know, kind of like you would if you were at a, at a table, just getting together and doing some work at school. Um, so, but I think that's gonna be critical this year. Um, again, it, you know, these relationships are gonna be so important. Um, and allowing kids to have, this have a sounding board for some of these kids, we may be the only sounding board they have. Um, it doesn't change like by grade level. I teach high school and you teach junior high. Everyone else, I believe is elementary. And it's kind of the same thing. I had kids like that just would not get off of zoom. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to kick them off. They want to talk. That's fine. But I'd be like, all right, guys, I'm going to go cook lunch. So I'd just bring my computer with me and they would watch me cook. They're like, well, Miss D, what are you making today? I'm like, well, it's okay. We're having this. They're like, oh, I've never had that before. And I'm like, well, Y'all are strange. I feel like I have my own YouTube channel. I kind of feel, <laughs> I don't know. They're kind of giving me an ego boost, but I don't think that changes. So kids as young as kindergarten and as, you know, up to high school, they just, they want to talk. They want to, you know, be seen and heard. I think that's huge. Last couple of questions here. Um, gosh, I have several more questions, but we're, we're over. I'm trying to decide if I, no. Usually when I decide I'm going to ask a question, I shouldn't have done it. So I'll ask <laughs> these other two. Um, so what can parents to do once school is in person to make your job safer for in-person learning? Or do you know? I think this is just a kindergarten thing. So kindergarten parents listen up. <laughs> um, they can't open anything. So when you're packing their lunch, when you're doing like the applesauce, everything should be, I think, at least I think disposable because they can just, you know, like they're going on a field trip, maybe open their chip bag and paper clip it because the less contact, I mean, and teach them how to tie their shoe, get started on that because I can't imagine not touching my kids in some way in the day because that's all I do. Work on your pant buttons, your pant zippers, your shoes tying and how to open things. But I know that's like only me. So everyone else, you can go ahead and talk. No, I on purpose had a kindergarten teacher on the show because 
you guys have a very different point of view. You're going to be much more, or you usually are much more hands-on with your kids. Um, so I wanted your POV. So that's, that's a very good point. Please don't bring stuff that I'm going to have to open for your kids. <laughs> I always joke with her that freshmen and kindergartners are the same, but I can't <laughs> ever had to help with street buying or bathroom duties or, you know, anything like that or lunches. Um, but no, totally. Just, I think also making sure they know like um, to be mindful and respectful too of like your teacher's health. And it, it, I mean, it's hard because our kids, like the world does revolve around them sometimes and in their minds, of course, but like, it's like, it's not just your health. It's not just your best friend's health. It's like your teacher's health and this and that. And so just making sure they're being mindful because I think in turn, if they are and they're practicing that, then they will be more hygienic and more aware and just because um, there's so many little things. I mean, my kids did some weird stuff in my <laughs> disgusting i had a kid that would bring, get mcdonald's in the morning and then leave like jelly packets on my room in the floor and i'm like man so it's gonna go from mcdonald's to that kid to my floor to me cleaning it up and i'm like no um so i think setting things expectations that are age appropriate is totally fair wow. to make sure we're all being safe and clean <sighs> mm -hmm. got a couple of people online saying keep those sick kids at home oh yes, yes. Yes, that yeah. is, uh, that was going to be one of my points. Um, I may teach third grade, but yes, yeah, same thing. Opening things, touching people, uh, tying shoes. That is still a thing for some kids in third grade, but not just keep sick kids at home. Uh, if we call you to come and pick up your child, please do so expeditiously. Um, if we call you at 9 a.m., please do not wait until 4 p.m. to come and pick up your child. <laughs> we would like for you to come and get them at 9 a.m. when we call. But, you know, and, and I am a parent. I am human. I do understand that things do happen. But this, this is a global pandemic. It's a health crisis. And teachers' health is just as important so you know being patient with us and telling your students that we're not hugging you because we don't want to be sick not because Ms. Mm -hmm. mean or that your teacher does not like you you know just ensuring that they they truly understand the reason why we cannot do certain things that is mm -hmm. Definitely not personal. We love all of our students. And so we just, we're very cautious, cautious at this time and we don't want to love on them. We don't want to hug on them. We don't want to do high fives out of safety. Not, you know, it's nothing personal against your child because mm -hmm. little people, even third grade, think, oh, my teacher didn't hug me because she does not like me. You know, right. make sure that they know we do love them. It's just that we can't at this time. Yes. Anybody else? No? Okay. They got it on that one. All right. Um, yeah, so just hey, from, um, for me, but just, just, just teach your kids not to be nasty. Just, <laughs> just, just don't be nasty. What if the parents are nasty? Oh, well, <laughs> well as, as Michael Jackson said, you got to start with the man or woman in the mirror. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to make the world a better place. <laughs> Take a look at yourself and make a change. Then make a change in your child. Yeah, don't 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 be nasty because they, they bring that nastiness to school, and it's already hard enough with the nastiness in normal times. But to be nasty during a pandemic is that could that could be deadly. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, so I did this show because I wanted to kind of as much as possible put parents' minds at ease that you guys are amazing. Teachers are amazing. You guys um, are doing a, sometimes a thankless job and you're doing it because you love our kids and because you are, um, you're concerned about their well-being and their academic success. And um, I, um, I feel like you guys have shared a lot of great stuff. You've shown your passion and we appreciate that. And um, any you know last words for parents that are concerned or worried about the upcoming school year? Um, I will say, I think the most important thing that any parent can do 
uh, whether your children are learning online or face to face is be excited at least to them about whatever is going on. Um, so even in my video, I said, this is going to be the most magical, amazing school year ever. I have not written a single lesson plan. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I'm putting that pressure on myself to make it, make it that. Um, but also they're going to feed off of our energy. And so if you as a parent are like, oh my gosh, the online school is the worst. They're going to log on on day one, expecting the worst. So yes. we have to all be in that together that whatever it is, oh my gosh, you get to work online. It's, it's going to be amazing. And as long as we sell it, you know, um, we can, you can't fake passion, but you can fake enthusiasm. You can pretend all day that uh, this is the most amazing thing, even if that's not what you're thinking in your head. My dad used to say that the last three letters in the enthusiasm are ISM. I am sold myself. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's good. That's a good tip. Anybody else? I would just agree with exactly with what Mr. Bussey just said. Um, our children imitate our behavior. And so we have to make sure that as the parents, I know that this is going to be a handful with me with three children at home and my husband and I are both teachers. But I know that I have to show them how exciting it is and you know how much fun this is going to be. But we have to make sure that we model the behavior that we expect our children to imitate and emulate. I think that that is definitely going to be the key this year. Mm -hmm. Totally. Just give grace. And if you see my one-year-old naked running across the screen, fine. Awesome. Dave, anything? Everyone that said um, the last thing I'm going to say is don't do your child's work. No one's learning. Oh, to yes. Collage, but I don't, I'm not grading your collage. I want to know what a five-year-old does, you know? So, and that's not teaching them anything. So be a part of their learning, but don't do their learning, please. Yes. And I, can you say that, I can a, you say that one more time? Right. Louder for the people in the back. <laughs> <laughs> one more again, one more again. <laughs> yeah, I had a friend who's a teacher and they're uh, a kindergarten teacher. And her class, when they were taking their online test, the cameras were on as a part of the, uh, the test. Mom didn't know that. And so when the teacher looks and the whole test is done in six minutes, the whole time it's the mom clicking. So she had to get on and say, hey, mom, um, now I need him to do it. And so I had no, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine how awkward that moment was. So but yeah, let, let your kids do your work, do their work. They, it will be fine. You know, right. it's okay if they're wrong. It's okay. That's yes. That's part of growth. Yes. Right. That's kind of the point. See if they're wrong, so you know how to teach them. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, my last thoughts is, you know, that um, you know, this is new, but uh, it's going to be okay, and we're going to get through it together. We're going to figure this out. And um, we're going to, you know, we, we sh you know, show enough are not here for the money right now, <laughs> you know, and, um, but we're here because we, we love your children and we're going to roll up our sleeves and we're going to make this the best year possible for your children. Um, and, you know, the biggest thing you as parents can do is just to support your kids, to encourage your kids um, as well. Also, maybe maybe change up their their learning environment. You know, who says they have to sit in a desk for all day long? Uh, they can stand up. Uh, they can lay down. They and long as they go to sleep, um, they can you know go outside in the backyard. You see, I'm on my back porch. This is where I'm going to be teaching front porch or back porch all summer long. Uh, I mean, all year long, um, depending upon if I'm home or not. But you know, I'm just making I'm making it. Um, you know, I'm making it work. You know, I'm at home. And so they're gonna see my, my life at home. So just allow them, allow them to flex um, and also to, it, just to support them, um, hold them accountable to their work, um, ask them when are things due, um, get them on a study plan. Um, also make sure they're getting adequate sleep. I saw a lot of parents, uh, a lot of my kids, were, they just totally flip flop their schedules. They would be up all night and sleep all day. Uh, maybe get two or three hours of sleep. Um, and during this time, getting the rest is going to be critical as well. 
Um, and so to make sure that uh, they are uh, just getting all the support from you and the love from you that, that they can. And if we, if we go back, then we're going to, we're going to, you know, celebrate that. And if they stay home, then we're going to celebrate that as well. Um, but we just want to make sure that, you know, that you know that we care for your kids and that we're going to do everything we can to make sure they have success and that we are going to support them in any way that we can. And so um, with that, my child is crying in front of me, so I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> word, I would like to add one more thing. The other thing, um, and I'm pretty sure you have by now, but get to know get to know your child you know some children function very well on a very rigid schedule knowing that they have to do this at eight this at nine this at ten those types of things um but get to know your child and know you know if you're looking at your child and your child needs that break to allow them to have that break because the last thing that we want to do is to further stress them out because this is going to be a very stressful time for all right, guys, we are for sure over. But what I did want to encourage our listeners and viewers to do is to bless our uh, teachers. Because again, you guys are amazing. You're dedicated. And um, you guys are teaching the future leaders of our country. So um, what I'm planning on doing is sharing, some of you have made Amazon wish lists for your classroom. I know that kind of became a big thing a couple of years ago where teachers would choose things on Amazon and then share their lists. So um, if you guys will share that with me, I'm gonna put it in the link for the Facebook Live. So if anybody wants to bless you guys, then I encourage you to do that because teachers spend, how much is it? Three, $400? Usually of their money. Okay, David's about to chime in. I, I don't spend nothing. <laughs> <laughs> then then we won't money. include your, your wish list then. <laughs> <laughs> all, I want is, all I want is an iPad. But an iPad and a stylus and I'm good. <laughs> Empty classroom with subwoofers and all of that? Yeah, well, that was yeah, donated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, okay. I, yeah, I, yeah I, I had that donated. I asked to just kind of rematch. We, 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 we can talk offline about that. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> However, I think it's that they, teachers usually um, per year spend about $300 to $500 of their own money. And with COVID-19 and all of the safety measures, who knows how much extra they're going to have to spend to keep themselves and their kids safe. So I will share their Amazon wish list um, in the feed so that you guys can bless them if you want to. But unfortunately, we are out of time. Thank you guys so much for joining us. And thank you for all that you guys do for our students that are for our families. Have a safe and impactful year. So Noggin Educational Foundation is a premier, is the premier sponsor of School Day. So we always want to let you guys know what's happening with Noggin. At Noggin, our mission is to help close the achievement gap for economically disadvantaged children by improving educational opportunities for students, supporting families, and encouraging excellence and innovation in the classroom. School Days is part of our commitment to support families by providing access to experts who offer information and resources regarding all topics that income, um, impact education. And if you love this program, please consider donating to Noggin. Your gift will be tax deductible. Save the date for North Texas Giving Day, which is September 17th this year. So North Texas Giving Day is an 18 hour giving extravaganza benefiting local nonprofits here in North Texas. Each year, North Texas Giving Day helps with a significant portion of the funding that we need to operate our free educational coaching program. And this year, with the closure of schools, the education gap for low-income students has widened, and the one-on-one -on -one intervention that we provide is that much more vital. Our educational coaching program provides private tutoring using experienced teachers who understand the needs of their students. Your support on North Texas Giving Day has an immediate and critical impact on our ability to serve our amazing students. So you can go to our website at noggin, N-O-G-G-I-N, foundation.org for more details and to schedule your gift today. 
And as always, you can head to our website, schooldazedshow.com, for more information about all that we're doing and for the resources mentioned on School Days. And remember, you don't ever have to miss a show. Find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, and pretty much anywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Noggin Foundation. That's N-O-G-G-I-N. And last but not least, we always want to end by saying that David and I are parenting by grace. We depend on God to give us the wisdom and strength that we need to raise our kids into flourishing adults. And if you would like to know more about that, please feel free to email me at info at schooldaysshow.com. Have a great week and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.